Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for a virtual presentation and discussion on what research on learning says about testing and assessment. We're excited to be joined by distinguished professor Lori Shepard this evening. Some quick housekeeping items before we get started. All attendee lines will be muted throughout the presentation. Attendees may submit questions at any time through the chat function on your Zoom window. We may not have time to get to all of your questions, but we'll certainly do our best to address the themes and ideas that are most common. If you encounter any technical difficulties, please use the chat function and one of our support specialists will be in touch. And as a reminder, today's presentation will be recorded. This recording will be added to the CU Boulder Retired Faculty Association's website at www.colorado.edu slash retired faculty. And now, please welcome Dave Kasoy, founding member of the Boulder Campus Retired Faculty Association for his introductory remarks. Okay, I'm pleased to have an opportunity to welcome you all to the fourth Distinguished Professor presentation with many more to come in May and May through July. Our speaker today, Laurie Shepard, will be introduced by Chris Soldanya, a PhD student in the School of Education. Thanks, Dave, uh, and good evening, everyone. I'm Christopher Saldana. I'm a PhD candidate in the CU Boulder School of Education's Educational Foundations Policy and Practice Program. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing distinguished professor Lori Santillo Shepard. Dr. Shepard earned her Bachelor of Arts in History from Pomona College in 1968, being the first person in her family to attend college. She received her Master of Arts in Counseling from CU Boulder in 1970 and her PhD in Research and Evaluation Methodology, also from the University of Colorado Boulder in 1972. She joined the faculty in the School of Education at CU Boulder in 1974. She was named interim dean from 1996 through 98 and served as dean of the School of Education from 2001 through 2016. She was named a distinguished professor in 2010. Professor Shepard is a past president of the American Educational Research Association and of the National Council on Measurement in Education. She was elected to the National Academy of Education in 1992 and served as president of the Academy from 2005 through 2009. Dr. Shepard has received distinguished career awards, recognizing her contributions in measurement, research, and teacher education, respectively, from the National Council on Measurement in Education, the Educational Testing Service, the American Educational Research Association, and the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. Professor Shepard's research in the field of educational measurement has focused on bias detection, standard setting, and validity theory. In the 1990s, she helped expand the criteria for test validity from the outdated question of whether a test measures what it says it measures to the more demanding standard of determining whether the evidence shows that a practice or product is safe and effective. In recent decades, Professor Shepard's work has emphasized the integration of learning theory with classroom formative assessment. In her American Educational Research Association president, presidential address entitled The Role of Assessment in a Learning Culture, she argued that support for deep learning requires fundamental changes in both the performance tasks used to instantiate valued learning goals and the social meaning of evaluation in classrooms, explaining that our aims should be to change our cultural practices so that students and teachers look to assessment as a source of insight and help instead of an occasion for meting out rewards and punishments. In addition to her academic and professional accomplishments, Professor Shepard and her husband, retired physics professor Jim Shepard, have also raised a wonderful family. They have three children and five grandchildren. Lori is also a wonderful mentor and colleague. I've had the opportunity uh, to have Lori be my instructor and to work with her as a co-author. And Lori has modeled for me how to make your practice a reflection of your research. So please help me in warmly and virtually uh, welcoming distinguished professor, Lori Shepard. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I am very glad to be here. I wanna thank um, Dave Kasoy 
and Bob Grossman, who recruited me into participation to my uh, distinguished professor colleagues. I want us to give a special thank uh, to Chris. Uh, I learned so much from that co-author role. He was recruited to see you as a Miramontes scholar uh, and just won a dissertation grant from the American Educational Research Association. And because I was told that the purpose of um, these talks is to reach out to the state of Colorado, I thought it was important that um, how um, special our students are and the opportunities that they have here uh, should would be um, exemplified by asking uh, Chris uh, to introduce me. So thank you, Chris. I had to be patient through the whole thing, I know. <laughs> um, let me share my screen so that uh, we can get started. So, uh, and I should have said as well, thanks to Ka Young uh, for the support and the uh, orchestration of this evening, thank you. Um, to repeat, my title is uh, What Research on Learning Says About Testing and Assessment. And I will talk at the end about the young people in this photograph. Um, they are students at the Fannie Lou Hamer Freedom High School in the Bronx, the poorest congressional district in the United States. And they, uh, I think, are an example of what's possible if testing of the old version, variety, doesn't get in the way. So um, that's where we're headed in my hopes for the future at the end of this talk. So I worked really hard on this uh, organizational slide. I wanted uh, to alert you to the fact that we'll be talking about three different uh, learning theories, uh, the behavioral, cognitive, and sociocultural. I wanted uh, to try to show it historically, uh, which actually runs from the top to the bottom of the slide with dates in the case of the behavioral perspective. And notice that those dates go all the way from over 100 years ago to the present day. And uh, a point that I want to make with this talk is um, to call that an outmoded view of learning and to say it's still in effect and that it's what dominates our testing programs different from to the right, so there's kind of a historical chronology uh, left to right as well. The cognitive perspective and more recently, which means like in the last 50 years, <laughs> these things had different starting points, but they have overlapped significantly. And sociocultural theory has, I think, is I will call it the more encompassing theory because it accords with a lot of what cognitivists studied and claimed, but sociocultural theory has more um, ways of explaining why those things were observed. I've drawn a few arrows here to try to tell you the few times when uh, researchers, educational researchers in the learning, in cognitive science or in uh, sociocultural theory, tried to have influence on the dominant paradigm still holding forth uh, with these uh, traditional views of what learning is like. And uh, I'll mention the, those arrows. I also have shown you two little postage stamps that you can't read now, but they are the covers of two consensus reports from the National Academy of Sciences, how people learn one and how people learn two. Um, I'll add, Chris will, I hope, put in the, um, in the chat the simple link, and you can also just remember National Academy Press has all of these reports that I will be citing through the talk for free for download. Um, they're also for sale on Amazon, which I think is hilarious. One of them costs a thousand dollars. So just go to National Academy Press. Um, so next slide is uh, one of two slides that I want to show you um, to talk about that old view of learning. 
And when I talk about learning, I'm gonna alternate throughout the talk across the theories in talking about both what the goals of learning look like, like when you've accomplished learning as intended, what does it look like? And then I'm also for each learning theory, wanting to talk about the processes, like how do those researchers think learning occurs? And this picture is of the very earliest uh, standardized achievement tests so that this isn't just teacher tests in their own classrooms. These were used across schools and are over a hundred years old. And I hope that you can see from the examples that they're mostly about memory. They're mostly about facts. That's a conception of learning that was well suited to the technology of the time, multiple choice testing, which came in about the same time. We are famous for having invented uh, the optical scanning machine that was uh, America's gift to the world, uh, if you want to think of it that way. Alongside those, that view of what you should learn, behaviorism, and I pictured B.F. Skinner, so that's how you should think uh, about the theory of learning that is uh, driving how people think kids come to be accomplished. It is atomistic in its conception of learning and it's important, highly sequenced, which means you don't get to go ahead to any of the interesting things until you've mastered by memory, the simplest things. It also included a theory about what tests should be like and that you could test, then teach that very thing and then test it again and nobody worried that you had taught to the test because they didn't worry about transfer. It was not a concept. They didn't worry about generalizing from this particular item to other items that now today we understand uh, that test was intended to represent. Behaviorism was aligned with a motivation theory as well. The idea that you reinforce each tiny step and you use rewards and punishment to motivate from the outside. It is an extrinsic understanding of motivation. And I pictured the young lady with the dollar bill. Uh, there are a gajillion of these examples uh, if you Google uh, something like rewards, uh, because it's still alive today. Lots of parents think this is how we should motivate our students to do well in school. Um, now we're switching from, that's the old picture. Now we're gonna go through the chronology of how politicians and sometimes cognitive scientists educational researchers and educational policy researchers worked with politicians to create the system we have now, especially in federal law. So the first time those tests that I was showing you, multiple choice, fact-based tests used to just be given by school districts to purchase them so that parents could learn a little bit about their kids. The first time they were used politically is with the minimum constant testing movement in the 70s, followed by basic skills in the 80s. And by the end of the 80s, the uh, point of my showcasing this report, but there were dozens of them by this time, by the end of the 80s, there was a research base documenting the effect of accountability testing, the effect of basic skills tests, dumbing down what it was that students were learning, distorting the curriculum um, by driving out things like social studies, science, art, and music, even, even in the 80s, this was documented. Um, and in fact, the first round of reforms is against this understanding that came to be shared by politicians as well as by 
um, researchers. So here I had to paste the together picture of um, Bush and Clinton, who was a, the governor of Arkansas and the head of the Governor's Association, uh, because they, in the Education Summit of 1989, um, aspired to Goals 2000, it was still far enough in advance that they could say things like, by 2000, for heaven's sakes, the United States can be first in the world in math and science. And I've highlighted for you the thing that's important about this ethos. So the details of each of these things I'm sharing is not as important as getting the flavor of what shared public understandings were. And the highlighted portion says, oh, we have to have tests. We have to assess students in these grades, and in, at that time, they wanted to do it in all the subjects, foreign languages, social studies, et cetera, um, because that's how we'll know that uh, we've achieved these goals that we're intending to achieve by the year 2000. This is my one uh, report from that time that represents the thinking of the researchers. Uh, so I'm citing here uh, iconic reports by Marshall Smith, who was at initially the uh, dean at Stanford, went to become Clinton's deputy assistant secretary of education. Um, and it was he and others like Lauren Resnick, a, uh, a president of AERA, but also a cognitive psychologist who had this shared set of understandings. The research base was, here's what we know about learning. And then out in the world, here's what we know, again, to that report that says, look at all the distortion of learning that's happened because of testing. So we'll just have better tests. Uh, and that is a, a phrase or an orientation that comes from this time in the 1990s. Get rid of the de facto low uh, level skills, um, establish challenging standards. And there's some wonderful thinking behind this. These folks were also rejecting IQ testing um, that, and they're rejecting the idea that only an elite group of students could learn uh, challenging material. So they're saying something we believe in strongly, which is all students can learn that if you provide the opportunity. But they also decided that tests that were ambitious in their content was how this was all going to be accomplished. They did also, though, note that it would take an incredible investment. They called it capacity building. We have to do a much better job of supporting schools and supporting teachers to do this kind of work, or um, we'll be disappointed in the end. So I made this picture as kind of a joke, and I, you know, you're not, I can't like hear you or whatever, but I was trying to make a picture to show the difference between the dominant Godzilla of the dominant paradigm. And then uh, it's not a King Kong fight against Godzilla. It's this little tiny character, <laughs> Jiminy Cricket, <laughs> you know, with lots of integrity, wanting to make right, wanting to improve schools. But this contest was not a fair fight from the beginning. The policymakers never understood fully what it was that the learning researchers were saying. The capacity building kind of got lost, especially when, and I, the drum roll, we should have a way of having the economists come in and join the politicians and say, you don't need capacity building. What you need are incentives. And that is very critical. That theory of action, and I've cited a, a National Research Council report here that isn't as silly as I'm being, uh, if you want to actually read about these competing theories of action, it was written in 1999. And 
already by that time, the intentions of what these ambitious standards and these tests were teaching to had accomplished was already in doubt because there was no support. And the claim of the incentivizers, which is if you just hold people accountable, they will figure out how to teach in fundamentally different ways. That was sort of unraveling already by this time. And then it got worse because what I'd showed you there as the thinking being contested in 1994 was ramped up tremendously by known child left behind with um, Bush the Younger legislation um, that now added tremendously to the amount of testing and to the negative consequences if you didn't raise scores to 100% proficient. The last bullet there I have is probably the most important. Good tests were replaced by more numerous lower quality tests. So this ambition that people had had, we'll just have better tests. And then when you teach to the great test, you'll just have good instruction. But that can't happen if you mandate testing every pupil every year in reading and mathematics, you actually can't make good tests for the amount of money that was allocated. You also have new ways to game the system, including teaching only the, in quotes, bubble kids. This is a phenomenon of this time. Um, bubble kids were the kids just below the cutoff. And if you raised them uh, to proficient, you could get the amount of improvement you needed to meet adequate yearly, yearly progress, a requirement of that legislation. Second to the last bullet, multiple choice interim tests. The juggernaut of now hugely widespread use of multiple choice only computer delivered interim tests came in with No Child Left Behind and that wasn't in the law at all. But the law was so draconian that districts started purchasing tests to give all year to get ready for the end of year test. And those tests, all multiple choice, were, were poor representations of learning goals. And they also taught kids that the reason to learn is to do well on these tests. And they gave feedback that was, you only need two more items to be proficient instead of the case I'll make when we switch to the good learning theories, substantive insights about how to improve is the kind of feedback that we know from research on learning actually supports new learning. We're about at the end of the bad story. To be fair, this report, also a National Research Council report, summarizes all the studies that were done um, a little bit more sophisticated than pre and post to see whether or not these accountability regimes improve student achievement. And to their credit, the best studies in this um, body of work um, use national assessment data, not the state tests, which were clearly inflated. The national assessment gains are more credible, but notice that they are small. Uh, so the canonic, um, iconic study by Dean and Jacobs so, shows a um, tenth of a standard deviation improvement, and the aggregation, the uh, meta-analysis across studies in the National Research Council report shows a 0.08 average effect size, which at the, if your average is near the middle of the bell curve, that's a gain of about three or four percentile ranks. It's not the kind of gain that people had hoped for. And my point is that you have a host of studies showing negative effects um, from this kind of orientation toward data-driven decision-making and bad tests 
the interim tests became what the districts pay attention to as evidence of learning in their schools. The graphic is of a data wall poster that shows kids, you can't see their names, um, but the kids can see their names when this is on the wall in their school. And we have plenty of research that tells us that this kind of shaming is not the kind of feedback nor reporting of progress for individual students that supports learning. It can actually harm learning to the kind of feedback that involves normative comparisons instead of substantive ways to improve, hurts learning, does not support learning. Uh, so these kinds of practices have come about because of the accountability regime. Now the good story and the good resource is summarized, uh, but of course this research had been going on uh, from the 80s and the 90s, uh, summarized in this consensus report about how people learn. And it's a very different story about how to think about the process of learning, as well as how to think about the learning goals. Students, you know about prior knowledge, you know probably about metacognitive strategies, like that's being aware of how you learn and doing things that support your own learning. Um, good readers uh, know when to reread, for example, if they uh, lose track of and uh, can't make sense. That is a metacognitive strategy. It's also the case that motivation is now recognized not as something separate, but that's integral to cognitive development and academic achievement. I'm, going, I'm watching the time and I'm thinking, I want you to be able to ask questions at the end. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster, still talking about what cognitivists helped us understand about the process of learning and used apprenticeship as a model of how it is that you can see what mature practice looks like, shared learning goals about why I'm trying to do this thing gives a sense of purpose and context to what I'm trying to get better at. And it makes more visible shared understandings. This is very different from postponing thinking, which is what behaviorism invites us to do. So this is, this is a different way of thinking about student learning. Right now, we are working on the next generation science standards, but I wanted you to see that even the science standards from the National Research Council, National Academy of Sciences was involved in creating these science standards back in 1996. And it makes this same important contrast, the difference between memory and understanding as a learning goal. And also um, notice the last comparison. Uh, we think it's just today's way of understanding, but um, when we say we want to reject a deficit perspective that characterizes students as not capable and instead focus on what they do know and take what we now today call an asset-based orientation to pedagogy, notice that that's in the understanding from cognitivists back in the 90s. I want you to appreciate the fact that this uh, never gets fully lived because the old habits are so pervasive and um, it's hard to change and do things in these new ways, even if we have lots and of research evidence as, it's, to its, as to its importance. At this same time in the 90s, uh, another NRC report uh, focused on just math tasks that were um, very different in asking kids to reason. And I've got bullet points there about higher order thinking that are to be exemplified by the tasks, um, connections, communication, 
a big thing was to ask students to explain their reasoning as a regular classroom practice and also to enable multiple solution strategies, not uh, a repetition of an algorithm or a one way of doing it. The phrase test worth teaching to was not in this document. It's part of the ethos of the time. This is another, this is an example from colleague Bill Penuel and, uh, and, and Phil Bell at the University of Washington. Um, it's a lovely um, example of kids being uh, invited to explain what's happening with water vapor uh, when it hits the cold mirror and to draw a model. What I want to share with you is why we can't do this on state tests. And I think it's, it's really important to understand why the, that hope, which was we'll just give better tests as the solution is not really feasible. We can't afford the scoring and uh, especially when we require so much of it. And I'm leading up to a future proposal, which is uh, we have to agree to do less testing in order to get good data based on the kinds of representation of learning that we really want. Um, and as long as you keep saying, uh, no, we have to test every single student every year in more than one subject, you can't do this kind of assessment. There are also problems with state tests um, because we can't do anything that is specific to one curriculum that another district would say is unfair. So there are problems and that's why this kind of work is much more likely to be successful if districts take it on or district consortia take it on with the understanding that this kind of assessment has to be linked with curriculum. Standards are not curriculum, they are frameworks for curriculum, but this kind of substantive work takes curricular understandings and commitments to teacher professional development. I'm gonna have to go quickly through two slides now where I'm showcasing some of the big ideas over this time period from the 90s into the present to sociocultural understandings of learning. Uh, and one of the biggest contributors was Luis Moll's Funds of Knowledge. The idea that we have to use kids' resources and the experiences that they bring from home. The cognitivists knew, he, Luis was not a cognitivist, he's a Vygotskian scholar as a matter of fact, but he um, can help us understand what the cognitivists knew, which is that connections and explaining how this is like that is part of how each of us makes sense of new learning. And a way of respecting kids' identities is to have those connections ex especially attend to the wisdom and the important experiences of home and community. Sorry to go fast on that. And I, I also um, want uh, to call out the discourse practices that so many researchers studied. And then we now try to make a part of our instructional practices in each of the disciplines um, so that arguing like a mathematician uh, or like a scientist is part of what we want kids to be able to do. This is not cookbook. That's not, this is the argument, memorize the argument. It's familiarizing students with an expectation that we learn to critique each other's ideas and to ask for evidence, um, not just a memorized answer. And the bottom uh, example here, from Paul Cobb and colleagues is important because we really are trying to change the norms in the classroom as to how we uh, overcome this previous norms uh, where you're trying to please the teacher, not uh, explain to yourself 
what you're trying to learn. How people learn too uh, is now 2018, reflects uh, not quite a decade of work, but many years of work to get to this publication, uh, synthesizing research over the last decades. And it puts more centrally the importance of culture in brain research, in academic learning, in what motivates us in uh, all sectors of human activity. Motivation to learn is fostered when learners feel they belong. So you hear, you hear more and more understandings about belongingness in higher ed, for example, as important to like, why would people stay at CU uh, if they didn't feel they belong? Um, this research helps us understand that each act of learning depends on each student's sense of themselves and how they are connected and what purpose they see in um, the work that they're trying to do. And obviously then participating in disciplinary practices, we say in this volume is critical to deep learning. It's one of the few things where I drew one of those arrows that the politicians, uh, though of course it created a backlash uh, in uh, the, the designating of um, common core standards were calling on this research and bringing that into the dominant old paradigm, trying to, I, I call it like tinkering with the old paradigm. We don't seem to be able to throw it out completely. So, a couple of quick thoughts based on the research that's closer to what I do is um, to talk about classroom teaching and learning and formative assessment. And I want to make the case for the fact that sociocultural theory explains ambitious teaching practices and formative assessment practices in ways that can contribute to equity because it respects who students are and acknowledges who they are as part of how we interact in a classroom and also um, makes the teachers make an effort to translate and grow from everyday understandings into canonical understandings if that kind of access to scientific language, for example, is um, an important goal. Um, sociocultural theory also says that we jointly construct our uh, goals. Uh, they aren't imposed because um, imposed goals uh, don't make sense to students and it's very hard for them to invest the effort necessary if they don't understand and share their value. I made this table to try to illustrate the two uh, teaching practices and formative assessment practices, most of which are the same and only a few of them like improvement focused feedback, which I've alluded to earlier, that we know from decades of research on feedback that it supports learning and improves learning if it actually tells you how, as opposed to normative comparisons is what I mentioned before. Self and peer assessment is a strategy that's a, an assessment strategy that doesn't have a uh, corresponding classroom practice, but most of these things are to, to be embedded so that you don't even notice Students may not notice that they're being um, assessed uh, because it's not about grading. It's about knowing what they understand and what don't understand so that the next step can support progress. Summarizing some of those ideas, the questions and tasks should provide qualitative insights, not quantitative scores because I need substantive information to be able to help. 
formative assessments um, shouldn't be graded. Uh, I, I can give a whole nother talk about why um, these kinds of platforms that record points are not uh, helpful because the points don't tell us what students know and don't know. And those, um, those requirements sometimes get in the midst of communicating with parents about substance. A productive classroom culture keeps the focus on learning instead of point systems that, um, that grade in progress learning as if it were finished. I, I just think we're conveying the wrong idea to students when we make it about points and even about missing assignments. What we want to pay attention to is learning progress and allow for substitutions if we need to, to get to the desired end. This um, item I included, included just to give you an idea of what I mean by substantive improvement. And I pasted it so you can't see the posing of the question. And it's actually question one that has multiple answers and question two. But the whole idea is that a frog has to get to the island on these lily pads. And uh, for, it's a fourth grade uh, or third grade, difficult third grade item um, to come up with what fraction is needed in the blank to make a whole. And um, the teacher who marked this uh, used checks uh, to say correct and X's to say not correct. My point is that it's in looking at a whole stack of these papers, I could see in the modeling which kids understood a whole and which kids had ways to model. And also some of the kids, and this student is one, um, could do the easy numbers, lowest common denominator, but could not do uh, nines and tens. That was, they couldn't generalize um, their strategy. But that gives you a very specific thing to work on. And that's what I mean by substantive information, not score points as feedback. So a couple slides to end with. Um, our hopes for the future should be that districts can do the kinds of curricular and teacher professional development work um, that creates a coherence in curriculum instruction and assessment. And I asked Chris to put a link to this report um, that was done with Bill Penuel, um, Elena diaz Bello, my colleagues here, and Scott Marion at the Center for Assessment, plus all of our district partners here and um, in the Colorado Department of Education. So this set of principles is um, sort of like that uh, chart that I showed doing the comparisons, and then it also says what districts and state departments could do to refocus tests on conceptually rich tasks um, that were a better representation of learning goals. And also, here's the important recommendation. Use sampling. The National Assessment of Educational Progress uses matrix sampling. They sample students and items. So they have rich coverage of a domain. Each student takes a very short version of a very tiny part of the test, yet they get rich data to track things that are needed at a policy level. And that's different from what's needed in classrooms or even at the district level. And the idea that people have imposed a testing system as if one test could do all of those things is why the state tests can't be very good tests. Um, and they can't serve the instructional purposes that I've tried to illustrate. We will have to conquer this beast. Um, I think there's public um, enthusiasm for trying to uh, tame the federal law the current one is already intended to be less 
stern and imposing and oppressive compared to NCLB. But the next version um, is, is an opportunity to do much less um, than we have um, to date. And um, if we could lighten that burden, we could do the kinds of things that are happening already at Fannie Lou Hamer Freedom High School and actually 37 other schools that are part of the consortium. Um, the New York Standards Consortia was established um, decades ago and they have an exemption from the Regents exam. And that allows them to engage in deep project-based learning. This picture is of students um, doing what they do every year at Fannie Lou Hamer, which is do uh, both chemical and biology studies involving the Bronx River that's not very far from the school. They um, keep portfolios of their work um, that are the, used at, in the assessments and teachers from other consortia schools come to their um, graduation exhibitions when they have to defend their portfolio entries. PBATs are uh, performance-based assessment tasks that are a regular part of their curric curriculum, excuse me. And these kids, graduates from this school are numerous at the City University for New York and even though their SAT scores are below what's the, the minimum required, they have an exemption there as well. And they outperform their counterpart, students from schools like them, they outperform them in graduation and grades at CUNY because I think, I think it's because they've had to write a lot. And I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, to the National Education Policy Center, Chris, because um, I uh, was assigned to collaborate with um, the principal of Fannie Lou Hamer Freedom High School last summer and fall to learn in depth what's happening in this school. This wouldn't be possible without an exemption. And I think that we, uh, we need to make more room for this kind of work and a matrix sampling approach to state testing that looked more ambitious, but each student only took part of the test would allow us um, to have less of the old way of viewing learning imposed through a testing system. Thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Chris. Okay, thanks, Dr. Shepard. Um, so now, as we move into the Q&A portion of the session, a reminder to direct your questions on the, on the chat function of Zoom. Um, so our first question comes from Bob Grossman, and he asks, apprenticeship is usually one-on-one -on -one or a small group. Doesn't this model of teaching require smaller classes, and as a result, a complete reordering of the educational system from classroom physical size to smaller class size and necessarily more well-trained teachers? Well, lots of things there, Bob. Thank you for the question. Um, so I, and I apologize that I think I've planned uh, and I kept, kept taking out slides and then I went too fast over that specific slide. An important thing to recognize is that those researchers learn from the apprenticeship model, some things that could be done in collective. So making thinking visible, for example, um, is something that we can do with small groups where each group makes a poster to explain their thinking. Um, we can do pairs where kids talk with each other and develop their answers so that we can take turns. So it doesn't have to be one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but I want to I want to honor the worries about uh, ratios here too, uh, because the I'm more vulnerable to that critique with the Fannie Lou Hamer um, Freedom High School example. 
Um, and I worry, I, I am not trying, I'm not going to make the mistake that those psychologists made in the 90s of saying, we've got a model and let's just impose it and then everybody can do it. Um, working with those teachers and the consortium leaders, they say, not everybody can do this because it takes such enormous commitments um, because those teachers at Fannie Lou Hamer um, have are also the advisors. They have family, each, each student has a teacher who is kind of like their homeroom, they don't call them that, but um, that, that's the teacher that also has the family connections and they loop, even though it's high school. Uh, so they stick with their kids for two years. Um, they, as a school, graduate the kids from uh, 10th grade. So they're ninth and 10th together and then they graduate them into 11. Or the, the detail of the commitment um, would not make that model generalizable. But I want to make room for that, room for IB, room for um, investments and, and district level curricula that are more ambitious than what we have so far uh, because people are just afraid to depart from anything like those reading uh, and math tests. So our next question comes from Andrew Skumanich. Uh, where does encouragement of curiosity appear? And I'm assuming that this is with, with relation to learning assessment. Yeah, well, um, it's funny. Uh, it's been more officially investigated under the interest uh, rubric but I feel like um, what, we're, what all of these principles point to is getting away from lockstep, not assuming that you do this and then you do that and then you get a grade and pat on the head and then you go on and do the next thing. It, um, all, all of this research on learning argues for meaning, shared meaning, participatory opportunities to learn. Um, and I think that curiosity is part of that. Um, so the kids uh, who go to uh, the Bronx River, for example, um, do different kinds of projects every time. So, you know, one year they're building an owl's nest for an endangered um, species there. Uh, because somebody helped them hook up with um, a community member who was doing that. So I think that if you open up and co-develop learning goals, you are attending to curiosity as a, as a motivator for learning. Mm -hmm. So our next question comes from Rob McIntarfer, and he asks, what can district administrators do to influence statewide assessment policies while we are still required to help administer tests that we don't think help teach, teachers teach and students learn? Um, good question. Um, I, think, I think that um, two different directions. One is what can district leaders do to speak to power it, uh, among legislators, uh, school board members, Lisa Escarga, I saw you signed up. God bless you for being here. Uh, talk to leaders because you can't just overnight when um, ESEA is coming up for reauthorization, um, change the mindset. That's why I focused on ethos. I focused on what are the underlying assumptions? What do people think learning is? What do they think they're getting from this testing program? Is, is, has there been sufficient learning gain to warrant it? So, so talking up, I think it's a matter of um, trying to change the conversation and sharing um, this kind of evidence within a district. I think it's important for teachers to know that they are safe. The worst imposition that I've seen is when a district superintendent posts principal scores in the conference room where they meet, not COVID, but generally this 
was occurring. And then you, you can watch that happen, that those principals then post teachers scores in, in the hallway. And then those are the same teachers that um, you can Google how much those data walls are happening to students because teachers didn't make that up all by themselves. It's a uh, cascading down. So I think that district leaders can uh, make decisions about focusing on the intended learning goals and not teaching the test, but you have to hold teachers safe from those scores, um, especially um, if you've given them a tough assignment, um, you need to provide the support. So I think we have time for one more question. So our next question comes from Tessa Fox, and she says, this was a great talk. Thank you so much. Sadly, as a high school student, I still see a lot of bad testing and grading processes. What do you think the best way to move to a better model would be? Um, well, a short answer is grades should reflect learning. And it's important to get away from a point counting that um, is meant to control students. Um, like bring a pencil and you get 10 points uh, is the worst uh, example. I'm against extra credit because that's like, go cut out, um, bring, me, bring me a link to um, a related story. No, if the whole point was the learning in the first place, um, I wanna give you an alternative way, invite you in fact, to come up with an alternative way of showing me that you now, late, but now you understand that and you understand what we were trying to do, what the assignment was supposed to support you to do, and here's how you can demonstrate. So I think it's trying to share responsibility as opposed to 80% is a B, and if you miss that assignment, it's a zero, but there's a whole talk about why zeros don't make sense in grading systems. So we have to get away from the, we, uh, the point system controlling us and think of ways to make it about the learning. Okay. And with that, I'll pass it back to Dave to close us out tonight. I, I want to say uh, other, I will try to respond to the questions that we're collecting in the chat afterwards. So thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so Dave Young asked, how is success post-graduation defined? Um, you're asking about uh, those kids at Fran Fannie Lou Hamer uh, Freedom mm -hmm. High School. Um, yeah. They, the, um, the study was done by Michelle Fine um, and um, they used uh, grades at CUNY and they used persistence at CUNY. I do not know, this is just because I it's too long ago that I looked it up. Um, I do not know if they had uh, differential graduation rates. The city of New York has lots of dashboard information. So where they compare schools uh, serving similar socioeconomic groups. Um, and so when I say compared to uh, comparable schools, um, they were using the New York City uh, dashboard data uh, and then the CUNY outcome data. Okay, I think I uh, unmuted myself. I want to thank uh, Laurie for an imaginative and innovative presentation on learning. As somebody who uh, taught at the university for 40 years, there are things I just learned tonight that I never knew before. So thank you for that, filling us in on, on, on this stuff. Uh, um, I think uh, people will walk away from this with a broader perspective on what's required to encourage students to learn and uh, what's required to get uh, instructors to motivate students to learn. So thanks a million, great presentation. And I think uh, a lot of people will appreciate what they've learned tonight. Thank you. Thank you.